Welcome everyone to the Spiritual Forum. I'm so glad you're here. I've got such a fun guest today and I'll introduce her in just a minute. But I want to say a few things. I just got back from the Unity People's Convention in Overland Park, Kansas, and I was tabling there to promote the Whole Planet Spirituality Retreat at Unity Village, which is October 19th through the 22nd. And I'm leading that and I've got great guest speakers and a great keynote speaker and We've got fabulous everything, great plant-based food. I want you to go to the spiritualform.org slash retreat to learn all about it. And please register soon. It is a very, very, very special place. You can be anywhere on the spectrum when it comes to how you relate to animals and creation and all of that. We're there to welcome everybody. So anybody who's a curious omnivore, anybody who's vegetarian, anyone who's vegan, come along, bring your friends, and we just have a wonderful, loving time. And before I go any further, I also have started to, I've also decided to give shout outs to people who are donating to the podcast ministry, because this is 100% donation based, at least at this point, I'm looking at ways to monetize a podcast, but trust me, I would rather not have it full of advertisements. I love it being donation based. So loving all all my donors, it doesn't matter if you give a dollar, $5 or a whole bunch more, it doesn't matter. And this week, I want to shout out to Chris and Debbie. Thank you so much for giving. And each week, I'm going to shout out to somebody else. So if I miss your name, I'll catch up. Um, only other thing I want to say is all the other stuff with podcasts, rate, review, comment. I love the comments. I've been getting a lot of comments on YouTube and I answer them and it's really great to connect. You can also connect on Facebook with the Spiritual Forum community page. And um, that's also where we kind of create community. All right. That's enough for, of my talk. Let me introduce my guest, Teresa Baron Kulat pioneer in the field of collaborative process, works as a lawyer, mediator, and coach in the divorce space. An author and sought-after speaker, she's got a gift of creating clarity in the face of confusion. While raising her two young children, Teresa started Trinity Law Firm in a Chicago suburb in 2003 so that she could offer unique legal services and balance her schedule with the well-being of her family. For 20 years, she sought to create an environment and approach that supports her clients in reaching a settlement that they can move on to building healthy futures. Terry, which is how I'm going to refer to her, is also a deeply spiritual person. She's a student of many religions, provides coaching using astrology, and has mastery level training from the Tantra Nova Institute and quantum healing training in the Rowley method. The Rowley method, or is it the Rowley method? Rowley, the Rowley method. Rowley method. In her work, she combines her legal and spiritual skills to help people every day. Now, you may recognize Terry's voice if you've listened to any of the first 140 episodes of the Spiritual Forum podcast, because Terry was a member of the Spiritual Forum community before I moved to a solely hosted podcast format. So welcome, Terry. Hi, Carol. This is fun. <laughs> it is fun. It's always fun. Wherever you are, you bring fun. That's for sure. Well, and thank you very much for having me. And I just really want to acknowledge you and the work that you do here on the podcast, because really you are one of the people in my life who I truly admire on so many levels, like personally, professionally, and spiritually. So thank you for all you do. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Terry. I really appreciate that. I don't get a lot of feedback anymore now that I'm kind of on a podcast and it's it's out there. But when I do get feedback, it's like, oh, it warms my heart. I feel like I, I know, I know in my heart and have great faith that whatever conversation is had here, it goes out into the airways, it 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 blesses somebody out there. It play, may bless a thousand, it may bless a hundred, ten, one, it doesn't matter. It does go out there. And I do trust that that spirits doing spirits work in that way. But these kinds of conversations that we have, I think are so important for us to just to kind of shift the energy and the consciousness of the world so that we bring more heaven to earth, more love, more light and all that. So it's really important to have these conversations. So thank you for playing. Amen. <laughs> so, Amen. Here, so you open the door for me and I'll share that. Like, I really do listen to the spiritual form podcast. And as I was like thinking about, okay, what are we going to talk about? I am very much moved by how people get on and tell their stories. Like when we were in person, it was more kind of fluid, but now that you're kind of individually. So I'm actually also grateful to be able to tell kind of a fuller story of my life in that you um, shared kind of my professional bio. Um, but really what's more interesting is my spiritual bio. 
So if you don't mind, I'll kind of start there. How about that? Go ahead. That sounds great. So I was raised Catholic in the suburbs of actually South side of Chicago. And now we're in the suburbs um, and very steeped in mystical traditions, I would say in the family. Uh, but I went to a public grade school and in eighth grade, <clears throat> we were told to go home and write a speech for speech class that was supposed to be five minutes long. And I went home and my parents had this giant coffee table book about astrology. So basically I just read the thing cover to cover and I wrote an outline. I did the history. I had handouts and I stood up in front of my eighth grade class and taught them about astrology. And then of course the students start asking, well, my birthday is October 5th. What does that mean? And then I'm up there chatting away and literally the bell rang. The teacher just let me go because most people were scared to get up and talk in front of people. And I was just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But that really did begin my journey into astrology and kind of metaphysics generally. Um, and really I never let go of that. It's almost part of my, how my brain works. Um, and it connects a lot of dots for me. So um, I share that because I then went to a Catholic high school, a Jesuit university. So I had both the traditional and the non-traditional. Ultimately, I found unity. So I was moved to Minnesota in the 80s and went to the unity of Golden Valley up there, which was kind of my first unity home. Um, but then just to, again, I, I, I love that I get to tell the story. So when I lived in Minnesota, I went for a past life regression. Okay. And the man, his name was Cal Appleby, and he was a psychotherapist who did hypnotherapy. And so he regressed me. I won't even go into what it was, but it was important. You know, it was kind of help, helped me as a 20 something figure out what I was doing and where I was going. So it's relatively important here because I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. I ultimately came back from Minnesota, back to Chicago. I ultimately went to law school and still was doing Catholic things. Okay. So I took retreats. I became a retreat leader. And so now we're going to fast forward to the late nineties. I'm married. I have a kid. I'm practicing law and I'm leading retreats. And there was something inside of me that was like, wait a second. I, I go over here to my office and I have all this knowledge and this expertise, but I don't get to include any of my spirituality. And then I was like, and I go to the retreat center and I'm helping people and I'm, you know, sh sharing scripture. I did like a workshop on school tools for spiritual growth, but my legal training has no place. So in the spring of 2020, I'm working with my spiritual director. I'm like, there's got to be a way to integrate these two things. And so she sent me to the Institute of Noetic Sciences. If any of you guys know what that is, I was reading Ken Wilber and I was trying to find my community and I just, there, I couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, fine. And I go, God, you aren't giving me anybody to help. I'll do it on my own. I don't know how, but if you're telling me I'm in it by myself, that day, driving home from the Warrenville Cynical, I popped into Borders Books and there was a magazine called uh, Spirituality and Health. It's a great magazine, actually. And I opened it up and in the magazine, there's this little article about the International Alliance of Holistic Lawyers. Oh, wow. I'm like, I got chills. Those are my people, right? So I reach out and, uh, I, I signed up. I am a holistic lawyer, right? I want to meet these people. And it so happens that that spring, they were having their annual meeting in Chicago in June. Okay. So I sign up, I start talking to people, I'm going to help with the conference and I get a newsletter in the mail. And the newsletter has an article by Cal Appleby. Now, okay. That name, I'm like, it's a very unique name. There can't be a lot of people in the world named Cal Appleby. So now it's June 
And I'm in this conference with all these people from around the world. And Stu Webb is a man from Minnesota. And he is the person who really created collaborative law, which we'll talk about. But that's where I met him. And I said, Stu, you're from Minnesota. Do you know Cal Appleby? Because he was in this brochure, in this newsletter. He goes, oh yeah, Cal's right over there. He's the husband of this woman who is an attorney that I work with. All right. So that was one of those moments where like, okay, the universe has my back. You know, this is where I'm supposed to be. And uh, so I love that story because it's true. Okay. <laughs> and it shows like if if you're deeply committed to what you are, what God has made you to be, who you are in the world, like the 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 pieces will line up, right? So in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2000, I met That's what I was Stu. thinking. I think I, I couldn't have been 2020. <laughs> no. Yeah. In 2000, I met Stu Webb, uh, became part of this community. And it really was a place where I could be a lawyer and include, you know, my spiritual self. And, and the other nice thing, I mean, I'm now in a book called Lawyers as Peacemakers. Uh, Kim Wright, I hosted and with her, um, retreats for lawyers, right? So uh, that's sort of been what I've been doing. And we could talk about the work I actually do, but is that a good enough kind of intro to where I yeah, started? I, like I love the origin that. Story? Few, for sure. It's a great origin, origin story. And there's, there's a few things I want to pick up about that because, you know, God bless your eighth grade self. What adorable things. She gets up and tells everybody their astrological charge. Oh, that'd be so much fun. So it kind of sets you on, sets you on a nice, nice path. Uh, now regarding the, um, what happened, it sounds like you just like, you put it out you know, to God, the universe, like this is meant to be, show me how it's going to be meant to be. I don't remember what your prayer was, but it's such a great example of when we kind of surrender and go, I don't know how this is going to work, but if it's supposed to work, uh, my past going to be revealed in some way. And it was. Yep. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I, I want people to, to know that, that, that when, when you, you have an idea about something, you're not sure you can just say, God, source, spirit, universe. I want to do this. I want to go in this direction. If this is, if this is like the will of the universe of God, spirit, whatever, I, I trust something's going to show up and validate that path. And it does, or it doesn't, but it, when it does, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Everything kind of like one door open, another door open, another door open, another door open. How cool is that? Well, and the other thing, cause I was telling somebody a, a, a different story kind of in there. And that is, um, so in the eighties, when I was in Minnesota, I was in sales. I work for Procter and Gamble and um, I lived in Minneapolis and kind of the whole state was my territory uh, or the Southern part of the state was my territory. And, um, but I was dissatisfied. I was like, this can't be what God wanted me to do. I actually really felt as I was doing it, that I was doing God's will because I was selling incontinent products to nursing homes and hospitals. And yeah, and that's a nice thing to do. It really was. I mean, and I yeah. got to know people anyway, but I knew it kind of wasn't where I was supposed to be long-term. Because why? Well, it, did just, just, how it, it feel? was a, only using a limited portion of my skills. Okay. 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 And so at that point, um, I was like, oh, I think I'll go to grad school, maybe get an MBA, maybe go to law school. Okay. And I was trying to figure out what was next. And uh, I, I, I'm a dream person. I do dream work. And one night before I went to bed, I was like, okay, God, universe, angels, whatever. I would like to know what, what is my next step? And please reveal something to me in the dream. So I go to sleep and in the morning. So I actually have done like technical dream work and there's this, it's called twilight. It's like between the dream and waking. And so in the twilight, I was very aware of the dream, which was, <laughs> I'm looking out at this vast expanse and it's like golden, like for as far as the eye could see. And the words were, you are to work in the field. Oh, okay. I, I woke up. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? 
right? You were to work in the field. Okay. Or to work in the field. And so I kind of sat with it. And ultimately I was like, oh, maybe that was a field of grain and I'm supposed to be an environmental lawyer. Okay. That's what my rational, that's like, so clearly the images were on that right brain and the left brain had to decide, well, what, what am I doing? And I'm going to apply to law school to be an environmental lawyer. So I say that because I did apply to law school. All of my courses, all of my coursework was in environmental. I did not take a single family law case for class. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. I did take mediation class in law school. Um, and then kind of fast forward, and I think we should talk about the work I do, but now I work in the quantum field. Okay. Like mm, that is essentially what I can see is that I work in the field. Yeah. Love be it. Because um, as a divorce lawyer, as a mediator, I acknowledge and I help my clients see that, yes, there's the stuff that happens like at the personality level, but there's also things happening at an inner level, at the interpersonal level. And so like, I pray for my clients. Sometimes we actually, as a group, pray before meetings or I'll- Your, your staff? Well, oh, actually my staff, we always pray at the beginning of every like business meeting. Like when we sit down as a team to talk about our cases and stuff, I lead a, 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 a grounding, centering meditation and we put all our clients in our hearts and pray, it's basically praying for them. Um, but no, I mean with the clients, like, okay, got it. I have okay. a mediation and the people are open and they are there because they acknowledge their spiritual nature. We pray before we start. Oh, I love that. I always thought, you know, when I, when I was, uh, back in my twenties and thirties and I was working in engineering in the energy business and I was kind of, I was kind of on, I was on the spiritual path, probably in my late thirties. But I didn't know how to integrate that into my world at all. So I did kind of my church stuff and my spiritual classes and I go to work and do my work stuff. I, I couldn't even think about integrate it. But the more I got into the spiritual, the more I got into classes at Unity and my ordination path and all that, the more I thought, wow, we should have started every meeting with a prayer or at least a moment of silence, a minute of silence or something to, to kind of center the heart <laughs> and be open to the work versus just kind of dig in. And it's so rare. So that's very cool that you do that. Do you ever find any resistance at all with your clients? Well, I would say the, the reality is um, I offer it when I know the people are relatively open. Right. Got you it. Know? Yeah. And sometimes it might just be with my client, not with the whole team. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I love that. All right. Well, um, so, so I think that's, that's really something that people can kind of take away that it is possible and it is extremely healthy to find ways to integrate your lives, your spiritual self, your work self, your private self. We're all the same self. So when we're not bringing all of us to where we are, we're cutting off parts of ourselves. There's, there's kind of a little trauma point there or something like that. So how cool it is that you can bring this to law, which is not considered really, sorry to break this to you, but the public doesn't consider your field particularly connecting or kind, you know, I think they consider kind of adversarial, you know, so, <laughs> well, you know? and, and part of it is, um, let, just talking about the evolution of the law, right. And, um, one of my teachers, her name is Pauline Tesler, and her point was in the ancient world, you had doctors to heal the body, you had the clergy to heal your relationship with spirit, and lawyers were really about healing relationships um, because uh, any yeah. kind of a contract represents a relationship. And I say that only because it has seemed to devolved into an adversarial system because that's just the way the law legal training and the default system is, but most uh, lawyers go in because they want to be helpful. And especially in family law where relationships are what's going on, you know, a contract dispute between, you know, the oil company and the 
the transport company, there's not a whole lot of, you know, there is some relationship there, but um, in a family setting, that is important. Um, I think it's actually, if, if you'll indulge me, I think I'll jump off into sort of what family law and how what I do is a little bit different than what people normally think of, right? Yeah, I think that's good because when I think of like family law or divorce law, I, I and it, it seems like there is some sort of incentive to get the most you can for your client, and there's kind of a winner and a loser, and there's, you know, it's that it's that kind of dominator thing that's prevalent in our culture everywhere. But that's not what you're doing. So yeah, please explain. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier about Stu Webb. So uh, Stu Webb in the late 90s had been practicing family law for quite a while. He's a Landmark graduate in case anybody knows Landmark. And he was so disgusted because in an adversarial system, even if you win, you lose because you've destroyed the family and nobody walks away happy if you loot, if you win. And he was like, there's got to be a better way. He's like, I am not going to practice anymore like this. So what would I do if I could make it the way I want it? And he came up with, and it took a couple iterations, but essentially collaborative practice, collaborative process is where each party, so husband and wife, hire attorneys only to settle their case. So there's no, uh, if, and if they don't settle, then those lawyers must withdraw and the couple has to get new lawyers. And the reason that matters is that in preparation for trial, you're not gonna be fully transparent. You're going to like be excessive in your demands. Whereas in a collaborative process, it is focused on needs and interests and negotiating. So we do most of our meet of our work in meetings with everybody present which is different than yes, the I'm gonna try, I as a lawyer, my job is to get the best deal I can for my client. And the other attorney thinks their job is to get the best deal for their client. Well, then you're gonna be butting heads and playing games that really um, game theory, if you know game theory, like by having an outcome that benefits everyone and the most, you're actually gonna get, each side is gonna get a better outcome than even if they won in their outcome, right? So it's interesting. Um, so that was, so he started that in like the late nineties. I was trained in 2002 um, because I met Stu in 2000. Um, I had two small children and ultimately my husband at the time and I did get divorced and we used the collaborative process. And the point is that some people really could just sit down and work it out on their own. So I helped those kind of people too. But other couples really do need support, but they need the right kind of support. They, they need to be educated. They need to understand their options and then talk about it. And so that's how collaborative unfolds. It's basically a series of meetings, um, two attorneys, two clients. And then ultimately the model evolved. And now, um, if necessary, there are mental health professionals who are trained as coaches and as child specialists. So we might have a mental health, health person on our team to help this couple with their communication, help them understand what's happening to their children. And then we also have um, neutral financial specialists. So mm -hmm. what happens sometimes in a divorce is like there's a variety of ways you could do things. And I'm going to refer mostly to Either you're splitting up assets. Well, you always have to in a divorce split up assets and debts. I say that represents the past. And then you have to talk about support like maintenance, alimony, child support going forward. And so sometimes people can like trade or they can have different assumptions about what's going forward. So there's a lot of um, potential ways to settle a case. And when we have a financial neutral on the team, that person can run scenarios or say, hey, if you do it this way, this is what it's going to look like. If you do it that way, this is going to what it's going to look like. And a good example would be like a pension. Like if somebody has a pension that's going to happen in the future, but one person wants to keep it, it's not a legal issue. It's a financial question. So the 
so that's when I'm describing on a collaborative team, it's like a bigger, it's a bigger space being held. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really cool. And I'm thinking that just in the beginning, drawing the circle around the whole family versus the individual members of, you know, the, the couple that is breaking up that, you know, it's, it's a systems approach. Yes. Which we don't do overall. We don't do well. We, we find a problem in, in our society. We find a problem and we want to drill down on that. We don't really look at, well, we can drill down on that, but how is it going to affect the whole? And so um, I'm really kind of curious about, is this something that do you think that everyone could come to the table using this process or because I, I know a lot of people are very contentious and angry during divorce. So is is it kind of taking a, a kind of a special spiritually advanced kind of couple to come do this? Good question. <laughs> so I've been doing this for 20 years. And remember, before that, I had I, I have very strong underpinnings of a spiritually developed consciousness myself. I'll say I, I'll give myself a little pats on the back. So to answer your question, number one, no, the couple themselves do not necessarily have to be spiritually advanced or have any kind of, but they do have to have a genuine desire to remain in relationship. Okay. And that right. isn't always the case in a divorce. That yeah. is not always the case. Yes. Yeah. So, so a, prere a prerequisite would be, you have to have a genuine desire to stay connected. Or, or to be respectful to your partner. like. So now okay. I, I will connect the spirituality to it, right? Um, when we recognize that life is a whole, right? And often the enemy is just a, a shadow, like it's it's projected onto the other, right? And so, and there are times when truly a relationship is just complete. Like a couple has been together 15, 20 years, They've raised their children, their business is complete. They are ready each now to move on to a new trap chapter. So that is a very spiritually and you know culturally mature, let's use the word mature couple. Um, so they they fit well with my model. I also mediate and I also provide like legal services to couples who just know they're done and they just want somebody to help them write it up and get it entered. So um People do come on the spectrum. Um, if I get people through the door and I can tell it's really just, they want the other person to suffer. I refer mm -hmm. them out, right? It's, okay. Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's not going to work in the, this collaborative process. There's no. no collaboration there. Yeah. And what's weird is like, honestly, 20 years ago when I started, I was like, everybody's going to want this. I can't, you know, why would anybody want to fight? And and nowadays there's still plenty of litigators out there and it cracks me up that it this isn't like the go-to all the time and not many people know about it, but it is gaining in popularity. And uh, so it's, it's a good process for couples who do want to maintain a relationship afterwards, especially when there's children, right? Right, oh, when there's children, you, you're, you're gonna be connected forever anyway, at least while you're still alive, you're going to be connected in some way when there's children, because you've got all the holidays and weddings and events and all that. So there's no way that this person's going to suddenly be expunged from your life yeah. when you sign a divorce paper. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I do know that, that, that desire to make the other one feel pain. It's such an interesting ego trap that we, that we get in, you know, I've been hurt. I want you to hurt. And, you know, there's just something that about the forgiveness process, which is not, not saying whatever you quote did to me is okay, but that I'm not, I'm not going to carry that burden anymore. There's so much, there's so much of a lightness of being when you're able to come to the table with something like that. Well, and what you just touched upon. Um, so one of my teachers who I worked with, let's just say from 2000 to 2012, when she passed, she made her transition. Um, we did a lot of forgiveness work, right? Like, and I'll say that spiritually, I knew that I had to heal myself first before I, you know, it's the, the classic, you know, you can't get a speck out of your neighbor's eye if you've got a plank in yours, right? So 
I very much was committed to that. And so there are forgiveness exercises that I do for myself on a regular basis. I teach my clients. Um, in 2009, I wrote an ebook called Seven Ways to Save Your Marriage, okay? And the first one is express appreciation. The second one is allow forgiveness because if a couple is struggling, whether they want to end their marriage and move on, or they're like, oh no, we really want to save our marriage, but there's all this garbage from the past. Well, you need to forgive and you have to forgive yourself and forgive them and forgive the situation. And actually I use the term allow forgiveness because it, it recognizes that forgiveness is an energy that's greater than either of the individuals. So that's part of, you know, my methodology is to do forgiveness exercises so that you can be released from the shackles of the past. Right. 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 And then they ultimately can decide if they want to stay married with a new marriage, or if they do want to get divorced, but even if they get divorced now with that forgiveness, taking care of things, they still can be related in a healthy way in the future. Right. I mean, how, how much sense does this make? I mean, this makes so much sense. It's really important. I said this on almost every podcast. It's just really important that we kind of stay connected in a way. And I'm not saying that we stay in relationship or we stay married or we stay friends, but that we don't have these severed um, ties. It's, it's, it's almost like having an electrical wire just kind of like sparking on the ground. It, it just keeps sparking and it just keeps having this energy versus just being kind of calm. And, you know, we all just, if we all found ways to just be in relationship or connected in some way, I, I think we're really on the precipice of creating a, a new and better world. And I'm thinking about all the ways that this could be applied. Like my daughter does, um, she does a different kind of law. It, she does housing law and she's, uh, she's working with tenants and people getting evicted. And it's very, very contentious. And it's very sad because she's representing the, the people who are getting evicted. And, 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 and it's like, why can't, why can't they all come to the, why can't they all come to the table and talk about what a solution would be that would benefit everyone. But it's this kind of adversarial thing in the court. And it's really, really sad and destructive and people really get hurt. I can think of so many ways that this kind of collaboration would work for us to create a more human and a more spiritual world. Well, and there was an example, um, James Woods, he's an actor. Um, one of his, I think it was his sister or mother, one of his family members died in a hospital. And ultimately there's, you can kind of YouTube, Google it or whatever, but the thing that was upsetting is the way he was treated and the way they communicated. And ultimately they used a collaborative process to get back into dialogue because there were, you know, taking responsibility for things, owning it, saying, I'm sorry. The apology is incredibly powerful. So <clears throat> even as you were describing um, the landlord tenant thing, for each person to take responsibility for their part in the breakdown could then allow communication moving forward and then problem solving. So mm -hmm. the, the model does actually have um, <laughs> of application in other places. I got this, what I laughed about was, uh, so estate planning, for example, and I'm a mediator and I have been a medium. So like dead people have come to me in the past and I, I have since said, I don't really want that skill anymore, but there was a case where like a mother died and now her children are trying to figure out the estate and they were in conflict with each other. And so I basically helped them communicate and say the things they needed to say and the apologies and the healing and the forgiveness, it was just really powerful. So that just kind of popped into my head. There really is application for this stuff in, in many different areas. So, so the deceased mom came back and said, how does she want things to be handled? Well, honestly, what happened was she showed up and told me to tell them it was hurting her Okay. that they were in such conflict and that was never her intention. Okay. And this just points to, you know, my public service announcement. If you don't have a will or a trust, you need to do that because it, 
it then the person who's when they're alive can really describe how they want things to be done as opposed to this woman did not have a will so then these kids were trying oh. to work it out and she felt bad so she actually apologized that was part of it interesting yeah very very interesting yeah yeah so um where do you want to go do you want to talk more about collaborative law or do you want to talk more about integrating how you integrate your spirituality. I think you've mentioned a lot about integrating your spirituality, but what are people who just really don't know how to do that? Like, I mean, I think about, you know, we live in these kind of silos and people just don't know how to bring their spirituality to their workplace. And, and so was it, was it ever hard for you? Or was it something that was just really natural for you? Um, here's, here's where I'll go because it somewhat weaves a couple concepts. Okay. And that is body-based psychotherapy and somatic experiencing of things. Um, because in my Tantra work, um, I'm very aware of how the body holds trauma. Okay. And so if a person, okay, I'm also a meditator, have been for a long time, right? So every day, pretty much part of my morning routine is to sit in silence. I also pray on the uh, spiritual form morning prayer calls. So morning, this is my they, shout out. <laughs> shout out for that. We pray on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Friday mornings at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. And it's like a 10-minute call. And it's really a great way to start the day. Yeah. And so I, I say that because by starting your day with a spiritual orientation, with the recognition that, hey, I am a spiritual being, um, and a holistic one in that I have a job, I have kids, I have a house, I have a body. And by, by centering, by praying, by meditating, then I believe that spirit will guide us in what is right for us. So maybe for some people having the silo is how they're supposed to be, right? But I say, I bring in the body based because to me, the key is to listen to your body. Okay. Um, and, uh, <laughs> in my, in, okay, so I said I had this ebook that's seven ways. Well, now I have a course, an online course. And in the course, I talk about cuddle parties and body based decision making. And uh, we did an exercise, we do an exercise in cuddle parties. So you can Google that and look that up where you say to the person, okay, you have to say yes to every single thing I say. And then you ask them, can I hold your hand? Yes. Can I poke your eyeballs out? Yes. But so when you say yes, but you mean no, your body knows the difference. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in that learning of who you are and what's authentic, that's how you will know whether or not, or how to integrate your spirituality into your workplace. That, so you see how I connected all those things? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I get that. I get that. And I do think if a good start is in the morning, sit, just in the morning, sit, start for five minutes, go to 10 minutes if you want, but it, you know, start, start small. If you need to start small, start small. And it, and, and then you can even, even set your uh, alarm to, you know, four hours later, you can, you can pause for 10 seconds, a, a minute, whatever you want, but just kind of set these little parts of your life where you're just kind of like coming apart. And just just sitting and listening and not and watching your thoughts yeah. is it's what it begins to help help you create that space between your feelings and reactions and 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 it also begins to help you create a spiritual practice right. and so if you're in a spiritual practice you know your life is a spiritual practice the the silos that we live in are really kind of illusions you know it's not like we turn into different people when we go from work to home or to our study group or whatever we're the same person the idea that we're different it isn't that that's kind of a false falsehood so it i'm not even sure if it's integrating as much as it's noticing that i am really bringing my whole self to wherever i am and feeling safe about bringing all of it i i and that's, that's the piece too, is like, where do you feel safe? Where do you feel like constricted? Um, I've had, I, I will proudly say that in some of my collaborative divorce cases, um, the clients grow and then they don't get divorced. Oh, okay? interesting. Okay. Right. Because 
they prior to, and, and I had a really cool therapist who gave me, who referred a client to me, right? So I start working with this woman and um, husband gets another attorney. They had a small child. We're doing all these negotiations. And essentially the therapist ultimately said, by watching me and seeing how I could communicate, she learned how to really own what she wanted. She learned new ways to communicate and just kind of ratcheted down her anxiety levels. But the point is a lot of times our relationships are in trouble because we aren't connected to who we really are and we're projecting onto the other person that there's a problem, but really it's, we're just not quite comfortable in our own skin. And, and again, I'll, I'll go back to the Tantra training. A lot of that is trauma that's lodged in your body from early childhood memories. And we don't see them, but I've always said that we call in relationships to help us heal that stuff. And your primary intimate relationship with your spouse is the prime place to be healing things. So why not accept the fact that yes, this person is driving you crazy, but that is an invitation for healing, not an excuse to run away. So right. The running away is the running away from the self and, and the work to be done. And 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 I have to I have to say that we we both know there's situations where running away is the right thing to do. We we yes. both we both know that. So we're we're not advocating that stick in there no matter what's going on. But but th those are completely separate kinds of cases that that you really need to separate because you're in an abusive situation or something that's really not supporting you in any way possible. But the other stuff um, I've always said, you know, relationships is a spiritual practice. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's where we learn how to become our authentic selves. It's where we learn how to evolve our human and our spiritual natures. That's where it is. So when we run away from those, when we say, I don't want to be around people ever again, I, I don't trust people ever again, or I never want to get married, or I never this, we're really just, I think at the end of the life, we're going to find Oh gosh, all those opportunities we had to grow, we missed them all. And, you know, recycle, go back and try it again. But we have the opportunity with the people we're with, whether they're people at church or in our group. And like you say, particularly the spouse, particularly when you're married, that's the person you pick to work your stuff. And so, yeah. you know, hang, hang in the ring. Now, that said, you did get divorced and you've also facilitated wonderful divorces. Do you want to tell a few, can you tell a few stories about some of these collaborative um, divorces? Well, I think, um, I think the general theme of a successful collaborative divorce and a mediation or an uncontested, which is what I do, is that when the couple is finished, that they have a sense of, okay, we're now starting a new chapter. It's not the end. I mean, it is an end. You know, any, we know of the spirituality. Okay. So here's my astrology, right? So I'm born for those of you who know the language, my sun is in Aries, but my moon is at 29 degrees of Pisces, which is the actual degree of death. So I'm very comfortable with death and, oh. you know, like any good Catholic, I'm a resurrection kind of gal, right? Jesus <laughs> died three days later, resurrected. So the point here is, um, I had one couple, and this kind of maybe is a good example. Um, she and her husband had two grown children. They were in their mid forties, early fifties, and they just knew their relationship was complete. So I helped them with the divorce and we went to the DuPage County Courthouse and we went in front of the judge and we did the official, you know, show the judge the papers, you signed them, they were divorced. But we also went into, there's these little cubbies and we had a ceremony. And each of them shared with the other what they appreciated about their relationship, what they appreciated about the you know other person and what they hoped they would be able to continue to do in the future, you know, as individuals and as co-parents of these now adult children. And then at the end of that ritual, they had a, um, a peace lily. And if you know peace lilies, they have a root ball. So then they took this single peace lily, they cut it in half, and they each then got their own lily to take home with them 
And it was just representative of they had a, a single life and now that life was going to become the basis, the foundation for each of them having a new life and there would be connection, but it wasn't going to be together. So, I, I mean, I think that's a nice example of what's possible um, for people. My other, like, I really do. I'm so happy when I have couples who stay together. <laughs> I do. I had one, one client where, um, so I do karaoke. And I sing. And so I had invited her to a performance and she came and we chatted. And uh, a couple of days later, she explained to me that she she was conflicted. She didn't know. So she was praying to God about what she should do. And literally, as soon as she finished praying, the phone rang and it was her husband who had to talk to her about the kids or something. And she's like, I just knew I, I had to not, I had to make it work or try to make it work. So that's when they pivoted from being in a divorce process to actually trying to reconcile and they did reconcile. So oh, those are both great examples. I was asked once as a minister to do a divorce ceremony and I was delighted to do it. They ended up not doing it. And I don't know why, but I, I, I was love the idea of it. We, we have rituals around marriage we don't have enough rituals in our lives, actually. And rituals are really important for us to go from one phase to another. And, you know, our, our, the cultures in our ancestry did it all, had rituals all the time. And we've just kind of left them. We need rituals for, you know, entering manhood and entering womanhood and those kinds of things. And, but the, the, the marriage ceremony, huge, tons of money, tons of people, everything. But yeah, there's, there, the idea of having a, a divorce ceremony, or maybe there's another word for it, but, but to commemorate that, because this is an ending and it's a new beginning, just like marriages, you know, marriage is the ending of your singlehood and it's the beginning of this legal partnership. Yeah. So that's what every ritual centers around an ending and a beginning. So how beautiful that that couple wanted to do that. And I also can see this happening. Boy, I would love to see this happening with just couples breaking up. They're not married, but just, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, whatever the couple is, because there's so many severed edges at breakups when, when people, you know, just, just break up and, and how interesting to be able to kind of complete and be able to say, I received this from you, you know, and I received this from you and thank you. I was just talking to my youngest daughter about this this morning about how, all of our past boyfriends and girlfriends, all of our past relationships, you know, if you're happy with where you are, they, they all got you to where you are. And if you end up finding your, your person, whether you're in process of that, or you, you ultimately find that person, all of the past girlfriends and boyfriends on, you know, both sides contributed to that person being who they are and being in that place at the right time for you to meet them. So just bless all of those past relationships, but they tend to end in a very kind of severed <laughs> kind of electrical uh, kind of way and how beautiful it could be to create a ceremony around it. Well, and what, what you sharing just reminded me of is like the prenup concept, uh -huh. right? And, uh, if you're, I'm a Franklin Covey person, like beginning with the end in mind, right? So how will we know when our relationship is complete or yes, what will question. happen in, in the event of we decide we're going to go separate ways? And um, what part of my work now is I, I still do divorces because, but, but I do them in the way that I just taught, described, you know, if, if people want to do it respectfully and kindly and collaboratively and mediation, fine. And then at a point it was like, wait, they think they want a divorce, but they really don't. They just want a new marriage. So then I started doing the helping people talk and stay together. And yes. now I do intentional relationship design, which is people who are coming together. And part of it was because as a lawyer, I was asked to do prenups. Okay. Well, a typical prenup written by lawyers is horrible. I mean, like, it's all about, you know, I'm protecting myself and, you know, I, and it's like, you're, you're choosing to, you're committing to this person for the rest of your life. Can we talk about what we're going to create together and acknowledge that? Yes, it may end, but in the event that it ends, how do you want it to end? There's a whole um, area called conscious contracts where people 
enter into their agreements, but they recognize that it's going to end eventually, or if it does, how would we handle breakdowns? So the point there is that that's my latest thing. I totally love doing prenups, but negotiating them and having the couple like look at their values, um, look at what they want to create and talk about those things. And that's the crux of the prenup, not what happens when we get divorced, because it's just, yes. Yeah. And we know as spiritual people, right? What you put your attention on is going to manifest. Right. It's going to multiply. <laughs> right. So let's not focus on that. Let's focus on let's what focus we want to create. <laughs> How is this relationship that we're beginning going to end? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, th I just wanted to kind of throw that in there because that's part of how we can create a legal document, but it's got life in it as opposed to it's all about death for lack of right. Life. Right. Yes. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I mean, because that's what a union is. It's like creating, you're creating a new life. You know, you're not, you're not, I always say in my wedding ceremonies, and I'm sure other ministers do as well, but you know, you're not completing each other. You're two holes, you're coming together and you're creating a new family. And the new family is a, it's a new being. It's, it's, you're birthing something new. Even if you've lived together forever, you, by this ceremony, by this marriage, you are creating something new, We're birthing something. And it's something we are putting all of ourselves into. And, and what is that? What does that look like? I don't think a lot of couples really think about it. You know, they, they kind of just go through, through the motions of the ceremony and that, and it's legal and now we're married, but to, to consciously say, what are we creating? It's like having a baby in your belly. What are we creating? My daughter's going to give birth in a week. And it's like, They've created a baby. What is she going to be? How are they going to support her? You know, a whole bunch of energy goes into what is, how am I going to, not, not like, what is she going to be? Because we don't know, but how are we going to support her life? That's marriages too, really. How are we, we're coming together. How are we going to support the life of this marriage? It's a really interesting conversation to have. Well, and the other thing just to kind of get in there is there's some mystery right? I think when you first get married, it's like, oh, what are we going to create? Like, what could this be? And you're talking about possibilities. And that is one of the things that I noticed in divorcing couples, they had lost a sense of what they were creating, uh -huh. of what was to become. And that that's part of the process when I help people save their marriage, which is, okay, let's talk about what would you like to create? And you don't have to necessarily be on board or doing what your partner wants, but do you support it? Can you give them an attaboy once in a while? Um, and then again, breathing life into what's possible and what are we creating? And it's something new. And even like, um, um, you know, the, you know, this, your marriage at 10 years is different than your marriage at 20 years. It's I was different. just thinking about that. It, I yeah. was thinking about your, your consciously rebirthing. So there'll be times in, in a relationship, a, a marriage where it's like, okay, we, we want to birth something new and what that's going to look like. And I'm thinking, especially things like when the kids grow up and leave home, that's an obvious time when we're not creating that anymore. You know, we're not creating that, that little family. They've all, they've all left. Now, what are we creating? So there's an opportunity to always come together and, and look at who am I now? Who are you now? And, and what do we want to birth and nurture together? Yeah, this, and so I have several couples right now that I'm working with in this capacity. Um, and what's really cool is that, you know, they generally come in because they've reached the point where they're not communicating mm -hmm. the way they used to communicate, right? Or right. something has happened and it's difficult and they don't want to talk about it. But then when they're in the presence, in the energy, I hold space, right? For them to have these conversations, it really does, it's healing. You know, I, I laugh. It's like, I am really a healer. And uh, you're really a healer. Yeah, I cover. love that. <laughs> yeah, it's your cover. And you're not, a, you're not a marriage counselor, but you're a healer through, through this spiritual, legal work that you do. Right. And it's, I, you know, as any good healer knows, they're not doing the healing, you know, yeah. spirit is, is returning people to the right relationship. But when you hold space for that, then it allows them to be vulnerable, to say things they wouldn't want to say, 
um, to be heard. I mean, part of these exercises that I do is to just let one person talk and may have the other person listen. And the listening is different in my presence than it is if they were doing it themselves at home because right. it's just the old patterns at play. Um, it's anyways. also it's also physics. It's also physics when you're the observer. <laughs> the observer creates a whole different activity of what's going on. Yeah, so and I have it, some kind tools. Of play that. Yeah. I have little cards with you know feelings and values on them, and so I do have a, quite a bit in my toolbox, all designed really for healing. And some, yeah. okay, so some clients let me do their astrology charts. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, all right. Yeah, all right. that's very fun. Very cool. Yeah. So Terry, uh, we're coming on the time we need to close. Do you, I want to give you the last word and maybe you want to talk about your astrology charts, but whatever it is that you want to share before we close, um, I'm going to give you the last word. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll say astrologically, this is in the, okay. When you look at a chart, if anybody out there knows the language, when you look at a chart, the most important point in a chart is the center. And this has been my mantra is you need to stay centered. It's not where your sun is. It's not where your moon is. It's not where the transit are activating your natal Saturn. It's the center of the chart. And at the center of the chart, we are connected to the divine energy that created us in the first place. If I can stay centered, I'm relating to the center of the other person and it helps them stay centered, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then from the center, it's like the eye of the hurricane. The whole world could be going to hell and be crazy. But if you can stay grounded, and now I'm going to use the word grounded, because now we have to stay in our bodies. We have to be grounded in the earth because there's a, an intelligence of the earth that expresses through us. That to me is the most important thing to stay centered and grounded. I love it. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful ending message. And I will have links to your law page and your the relationship work that you're doing, whatever links you want me to have. You want to say them really quick before we close? Oh, sure. Um, tbkulat.com is kind of the, the hub. And my course that I just created is called Seven Ways to Save Your Marriage. So that would okay, be great. great. And, and we're great. doing like a discount code for people who listen to the podcast. Wonderful. Love that. Okay. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for sharing your story, your life, and the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you, listeners, for hanging in there. Thank you again for my donors. Really appreciate you guys. And I now close the spiritual forum. <laughs>